Hello and good afternoon. All right, Jordan's got the camera out. That makes me nervous. All right, welcome to our Grand Round series. Um, it has been a pleasure to be the chair of the Grand Round series that we began two years ago. This is actually our last standalone Grand Rounds for this year, and it is a distinct pleasure to have Dr. Duncan here to join us for that. I want to just take a moment, because it is our last standalone uh, Grand Rounds, to recognize some people who made this happen. Um, you know, first, huge amount of gratitude to Dean Lynn for giving us the support and funding to bring this, this caliber of speakers in. Marcus, Jordan, and Sam, um, this would not function without you. Uh, we would have no place to speak and no food for our students um, and no pictures to recognize it. So thank you all for the contributions. And I also want to recognize the Grand Rounds Committee. Um, I get to stand up here and welcome you all, but there are several people who have helped support this initiative. So uh, Dr. Lucy Papavoa, Dr. Claire Spears, uh, Dr. Dan Whitaker, um, who has been a champion from this from the beginning, and I appreciate that. Uh, Rochelle Leon, Christine um, Stauber, and Dr. Kevin Maloney. Um, thank you all for your contributions. I also just want to um, let everybody know that while this is the last standalone Grand Rounds. We are also um, hosting the GSU School of Public Health Research Day on um, April 17th at 1 p.m. And Dr. Tabia Akatonobi will be joining us. She is the professor and chair of Community Health and Preventive Medicine from Morehouse uh, School of Medicine. So, but for the reason we are all here, we are actually here to hear this wonderful talk. And I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Kevin Maloney, who will tell us more about our speaker. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jelaine, and, and thank you for two very successful years. I mean, the work that you've done on the Grand Rounds speaker series has been, you know, just incredible for our school. Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Dustin Duncan, our esteemed speaker visiting us today from New York. While I haven't had the opportunity to work with Dr. Duncan before, I've been a big fan of his work for a long time. His reputation as a kind and collegiate person within our academic circles precedes him, and I'm very excited that we can host him today. Um, Dr. Duncan is the Associate Professor of Health Equity Research and um, Associate Dean of Health Equity Research and Associate Professor of Epidemiology at Columbia University. Dr. Duncan completed a Master of Science in Community Health and Doctor of Science in social epidemiology at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He later joined the faculty at NYU before heading uptown to Columbia in 2019, where he currently directs the Spatial Epidemiology Lab and co-directs the Epidemiology Department Social and Spatial Epidemiology Unit, as well as the Health Equity Corps in the HIV Center for Clinical and Behavioral Studies. Dr. Duncan is author of over 200 scholarly articles, co-editor of three books, and recipient of numerous prestigious awards. As a social and spatial epidemiologist, Dr. Duncan employs a geospatial lens to study health behaviors and outcomes with a focus on gay and bisexual and other men who have sex with men, transgender, and gender diverse people, especially communities across the African diaspora. Dr. Duncan's research is intersectional and built on health equity framework. His innovative work on social and contextual factors, especially neighborhoods, aims to inform, develop, and evaluate individual and structural interventions aimed at reducing health disparities by improving individual and public health. I could go on, but I will stop there before I use up our entire hour. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Dustin Duncan to the stage. Thank you, Kevin. First, can everyone hear me? All right, awesome. First, thank you for this um, uh, really great introduction, Jelaine and, and, and Kevin. I'm really excited to be here today. What you're gonna hear about is a, a little bit of a thought experiment or things that I've been thinking about are ways we can approach science. So the title of today's talk is Nothing For Us Without Us. I'll tie it back to uh, some of my, my new work in East Africa. Um, the role, 
cross that out, necessity of intersectionality and not or positionality in health equity research. So I'm going to start off with talking about um, um, uh, 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 my intersectional positions and how that potentially relates to research. I'll spend time talking about health equity, but I really want to talk about intersectionality and positionality. I'll frame it in the context of some of my work. So for example, one of our cohorts, N2, another one of our cohorts, Turnt. Um, I decided to focus on a topic that I think is just really critical to me, which is uh, police violence. Um, and then I'll end with how we're applying these concepts to some of our new work in East Africa, um, which we're calling Tijuana. It's a new center that I'll be uh, uh, leading in, in, in Kenya. Um, this is actually Women's History Month, and so I decided to dedicate this talk to my mom, uh, Dr. Dion Jones. Uh, so many things I can talk about, she's my mom, but, um, but <laughs> right, your, your mom is your mom. But, but one thing I want to center is, um, is uh, the mentors that we have in our lives. Uh, my mom is, uh, is clearly one of my mentors. Um, so the take home message for today really is that positionality and intersectionality matter, and that they both are necessary for health equity research and their feedback loops. So when I was preparing for this, I, I first thought that in public health, we talk, some would, would say ad nausea, about inequalities. And we talk about them in so many ways. And we, that then the goal is, is that because we highlight these inequalities, the goal is that we should believe that they matter and that we should do something about it, like design intervention or design programs or policies, et cetera. But I also have started to do other work in policy spaces, and I realized that Different things matter to different people, and economics matters to people. And so I just wanted to highlight some of the, the costs for disparities. And similar um, to different lines of research, we have different data sets. And so this is a, a, a project where they wanted to quali uh, quantify, excuse me, uh, disparities as it relates to uh, SES and it re as it relates to race ethnicity. And they have two different data sets. And what I put is up there is the cost of inequalities uh, for race and, and economics um, with two different data sets. And so I decided here that I'll go with the lower bounds of the cost for inequalities. And the cost for inequalities for racial ethnic uh, uh, inequalities are over, 400 and, uh, over $421 billion. When it comes to um, uh, economic burden for inequality, that number goes up to $940 billion. So with that context, I'm going to talk about intersectionality. So when I first uh, came to Columbia, I decided that it was important to introduce myself to my colleagues, because I realized that they, didn't know, they may not know who I was and may, perhaps the contributions that I could give to the team. And so I, I, I immediately thought from this academic perspective, which is the perspective of a professor. I went to certain schools. I have this article. I have this expertise in these ways. But I also started to realize that there are other aspects about myself, and not just myself, about you as researchers that also can matter. And perhaps we should consider thinking about that or explicitly talking about that in our science. And so this is an excerpt from a positionality statement that I, I, I wrote, which describes things about me. Like any other data or scientist, we can put these uh, uh, concepts into actual constructs. There are things I describe about myself. I'm Caribbean. There are things I describe my, myself. I'm queer. There are things I describe about myself just as I'm black. These are all variables, of course, which we can study. So for example, country of origin. We can look at nativity. We can look at ethnicity. What's your ethnicity, as an example? So what I decided to do is, is um, as I start to do work kind of outside the US, I start to think about different aspects of health and how we would study them. And I started to think about this question of, if you were to think about how to study food or dietary intake among sexual minority men, what would you do? And so this is a, a, a fictitious question I came up with. As a gay or bisexual sexual minority men from the Caribbean, over the past month, how, uh, uh, how often do you eat uh, breads? fried local food like festival or fried bake. So what did I do? I came to this question by myself and I asked two colleagues. I asked one colleague who represents the population, i.e. the 
My colleague is from the Caribbean, a black sexual oriented man who studies black sexual oriented men, and another colleague who doesn't. And I said, this is the question. What do you think about it if we were to go in the field? And I had two different responses. My colleague who represented the population said to me, well, Destin, I think this question is really important, but the concerns are is that if you ask it in this way, this certain subset of people may not understand it or may conceptualize it to mean something else. My other colleague said, well, this seems like a great question for these reasons. So I'll give you a little bit of context. Um, my dad was born in Jamaica, and so I'm effectively Jamaican, meaning that I understand Patois, meaning that I, I, I eat Caribbean food often. In fact, on Saturday, I had a patty. Um, in Jamaica, we call something a, a fried bread food called festival. In Guyana, where my mom is from, we call the exact same thing, which has a, a remix, of course, bake. And in uh, the Virgin Islands, they call the same thing Johnny Cakes. And I was telling the dean earlier today, there are similar foods in Africa, not surprisingly. So for example, in Kenya, where I'm doing some new work, um, a similar food is called mendazi. So if we were to ask that exact same question, but not actually recognizing the heterogeneity in what these foods are called, we would of course miss it. And the answer is, is I see people shaking their heads, well, of course. But the idea is that if we don't actually understand those things that we're missing, we won't be actually assessing them in the right way. Or put it, different, put it differently, there will be su substantial misclassification potentially. So that's just an example of a health outcome. What about the example of a neighborhood characteristic? So here we just see broadly, what we do is we ask, this is a paper that one of my postdocs has been working on, where we look at neighborhood police violence and HIV status neutral care in one of our cohorts. Perhaps not surprisingly, we find that uh, living in a neighborhood with a lot of police violence, we see poor HIV uh, status neutral care. What we also see is that there are differences um, by site. So uh, 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 in our cohort for Chicago versus our, 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 our southern sites for how people experience police violence or how they, experience, how they report it. But of course, the question is the exact same. So it highlights that there may be something cultural or there may be something different about this one population in these two different places. So I'm just going to give a quick overview of health equity. Um, there are many defin definitions of health equity. Um, this is one of the ones that I've been going with from Yale um, um, uh, School of Medicine. Health equity is research that interrogates dynamic, cumulative, interrelated structures of power, environmental conditions, and economic systems that produce inequities in health between different populations. Health equity research also identifies, promotes, and leverages unique community-informed protective factors that are traditionally undervalued and understudied. There are many frameworks that people use to study health equity. Um, I would just say that the most important things are the terms that we use, being clear about the terms we use. And the second thing that's important to remember when it comes to health equity is that we all have different starting places. And the goal of health equity is to make sure that everyone has the same or uh, a starting place. Um, increasingly, when we think about health equity, we recognize that it's not just the, about the individual. There's a context for their lives. And so this is a recent model from NIH which talks about SGM health disparities. And they recognize that in addition to the individual level, their neighbor and network level and other structural factors that impact health equity or health disparities. Um, as a social epidemiologist, I spent a lot of my career thinking about one context, as Kevin talked about, the neighborhoods. But I started to realize through some policy work that neighborhoods are not just structured randomly. There's a context or there are policies behind neighborhoods. And there's a lot of work by colleagues that's starting to now think about policies and how policies can uh, relate to health, including policies that shape different neighborhood uh, uh, factors. So when it comes to health equity, there's a wide range of, of, of factors that one could think about. Race, uh, nativity, SES, uh, sexual orientation. So I'm just gonna talk briefly about some of the disparities and I'll dig into them deeper momentarily. Um, one, we know that there are a wide range of disparities when it comes to HIV, uh, including when it comes to race ethnicity. We know that there are a wide range of disparities when it comes to uh, mental health. We also know that there are a wide range of disparities when it comes to substance use. 
For example, we know that um, um, there are disparities um, in mental health, uh, black-white disparities, where uh, we know that there are uh, uh, black adults in the US have more higher rates of, of depression, uh, anxiety, and suicidality. And we also know there are disparities in sleep across domains, which I'm gonna dig into now. For example, we know that there are disparities in sleep. Um, we know that non-white uh, um, uh, 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 individuals are, are more likely to report short sleep duration both very short sedation and overall short sleep duration. We know that there are disparities in nativity. We know that there are disparities in SES. For example, those who have a lower SES are more likely to report short sleep duration. And finally, we know that there are disparities in sexual orientation, where we know that those who are, are non-heterosexual are also more likely to report a wide range of sleep, uh, poor sleep traits, including uh, poor sleep health. So I want to give some of the context to why this may matter overall. Um, times have changed, of course. Um, this is a slide from a, a course I teach uh, on uh, epidemiologic theory and methods for sexual and gender minority health. And I talk about, this is a, 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 a Time Magazine a, 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 a picture uh, from the, the magazine, I think it's from the 90s, where Ellen came out and said, yep, I'm gay. Well, the time, the landscape has changed, where there are many uh, uh, people who've come out on a wide range of, of platforms, including on social media, but also so we see the composition of, of who's represented is changing. So for example, this is a, 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 a picture from Entertainment, a weekly magazine, um, which highlights um, uh, uh, the uh, people from the cast of Pose who are uh, mainly racial uh, minorities who are also sexual and gender minorities. We know when it comes to NIH that very few funds overall have been focused on SGM health. And we also know within that category that certain groups have been uh, more represented and less represented. So for example, we know here that 86% of studies have solely focused on sexual minority men. And we see more recently that um, sexual and gender minorities have been one population that have been uh, highlighted as a, a designated minority uh, health disparity population. So let's just briefly talk a little bit more about some disparities. We see that there are SGM disparities in healthcare access. There are SGM disparities in depression and anxiety. There are SGM disparities in alcohol and drug use. There are some disparities in HIV. And when we think about within that category, there's heterogeneity, not surprisingly. While we know that about one in six sexual minority men in their lifetime will acquire HIV, we know there are differences. So for example, that number is about one in 11 for white MSM and about one in two for black MSM. We also know that black MSM have sheer larger numbers of those who will acquire HIV. We know that, that, um, that, the, that uh, the disparities have consisted or persisted despite the advent of technology, such as PrEP. Um, we know, for example, from theories such as fundamental causes theory, that when, we, then when there's an introduction of a new technology, for example, uh, intervention, the groups who are going to be, um, who are most likely to uptake those interventions are those who are more advantaged. And we know that those who are disadvantaged are going to be less likely to uptake, which is what we see here in our data. We see here that black MSM are not meeting their PrEP goals where white MSM are. And we know that there are disparities across the treatment cascade. So now I'm gonna give a little bit of context for why I think these disparities exist. Well, one, some historical context on criminalization. Um, we know that prior to 1962 that um, all states had laws um, against uh, consensual same-sex behavior, um, but the laws were struck down at different time periods. And the laws were struck down later, in, uh, uh, meaning um, uh, in 2003, uh, by many of the southern states. We see that there's a context to medicalization as well. Um, in 1973, the American Psychiatric Association removed the diagnosis of homosexuality as uh, 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 from its manual, 
but we also see that there are state variation in, in uh, the bands of conversion therapies still. We know there's a context of employment. Um, we know that there are some states that have no active employment uh, discrimination laws. We also know there's a context of housing. For example, we know that there are many states, including states in the South, that have no laws protecting against housing discrimination. In addition, we know that there are laws um, uh, for hate crimes. And we know there is substantial variation by state. Finally, bullying. Um, we know that there, there are some states that have no enumerated anti-bullying policies or laws. So here's the example of, of one paper from a colleague who wanted to ask the question, are mental health problems in higher in LGBT populations with higher structural stigma? What he did is he defined states with higher structural stigma as those who had higher hate crimes and those had had um, um, no, no employment um, uh, 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 discrimination policies. States that had no protective policies for either were in red. States that had uh, protective policies for at least one were in blue. Perhaps not surprisingly, um, those who live in states with no protective policies compared to those who had one or, or had protective policies, had worse psychiatric outcomes, including dysthymia, um, generalized anxiety disorder, PTSD, and comorbidities. So now I'm gonna talk about intersectionality and positionality, why it matters, and why I want you to consider it to, for, to matter in your work. So intersectionality is often reduced to individual components, individual identities, but that's not what intersectionality is about. Intersectionality is all about privilege and power. It's about how different intersecting identities relate to structural structure. Again, privilege and power are the essential tenements or, or elements of positionality. His positionality, while in vogue now in public health, so we hear names like Lisa Boleg and Greta Bauer as leaders in the field, and has a long history. Um, in 1951, um, Sojourner Truth, a freed slave, Talked, uh, gave a speech titled I Ain't a Woman, uh, which she described the intersections of race and gender, and it was, the term was coined in 1991 by Kimberly Crenshaw. I'm gonna read this speech if you haven't read it. Um, There's a snippet of it, because I think it's quite powerful. Um, Sojourner Truth says the following. That man over there says that, that women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches, and to have the best place everywhere. Nobody ever helps me into carriages or over muddy puddles or gives me any best place. And I know a woman, look at me, look at my arms. I have plowed and, pl and planted and gathered into barns and no man could ever heed me. And I know a woman, I could work as much and eat as much as any man when I could get it and bear the lash as well. And I know a woman, I have borne 13 children I've seen most slow off into slavery and cried out my mother's grief, and but Jesus heard me, and I know a woman. Um, Kimberly Crenshaw coined this term and really coined the term of infusing a, 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 a critical race theory and black feminist theory. Um, Patricia Hill Collins is one of the leading founders of intersectionality, and there's a number of, of public health colleagues, I think Lisa Boleg's probably the leading one in the field, who's really pushing this work forward. Um, this is me with Lisa when I was uh, attending an intersectionality training institute. And for those of you who are students in the audience, I would encourage you to consider attending it as well. So here's an example of intersectionality in real life. Um, this is a, a quote from one of Lisa's uh, qualitative studies where uh, 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 one of her participants said the following. Well, it's hard for me to separate my identities. When I'm thinking of, of me, I'm thinking of all of them as me. Like once you've blended the cake, you can't take the parts back to its main ingredients. I'm a gay man. Also, there's something to be said about aspects of being a black man. So in intersectionality, there's a wide range of intersectional positions that can matter. Race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, religion, et cetera. Encouragingly, I'm encouraging colleagues to think about intersectionality, again, not at these individual factors, but also at broader levels, such as geography. 
There are a number of ways that we can approach intersectionality. The most common approach, or one common approach, is focusing on a specific, particular population, which is a fo a approach that my group does. Another approach is considering some type of effect modification in that association. Colleagues are also using uh, late in the class approaches and other approaches such as decomposition methods. And some of that work I'm thinking of is John Jackson, for example, from uh, Hopkins. This is just one simple example where we look at effect modification. We, our research team wanted to ask the question, are stressful life events associated with sexual risk behaviors? Pretty simple question. Perhaps not surprisingly, we see an association. So we see that stressful life events are associated with, with um, sexual risk behaviors. Then we wanted to ask, well, are there aspects about incarceration that can matter for this association? Well, let's think about it. In the context of the states, like many other places, when one's incarcerated, you lose a lot of privileges in, 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 in society. In fact, I serve a National Academy of Medicine committee uh, 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 that focuses on developing cannabis policies, or cannabis, uh, cannabis policies. Um, and I learned that once someone's incarcerated, you lose 40,000, there are 40,000 uh, repercussions for that. So we decided that, well, this is already a sample that has lost privileges and powers because of who they are. So if one was incarcerated, we would imagine that they, this association could potentially be stronger given that loss of privilege and power. So we just did a simple analysis. We wanted to look at whether someone's incarcerated versus not, and what did we find? We found stronger associations, or those effect, the effect estimate, not to mention the level of significance, but the effect estimate was higher for those who report having a history of incarceration versus those who do not, suggesting that there's something about this intersectional factor that matters. And increasingly, studies are doing multi-level models thinking about this intersectional perspective, thinking about uh, uh, contextual policy-level factors as it relates to health. And this is one example of a paper by Devin English where he does so. Um, this is an, another one of his papers where he looks at one structural uh, oppressive factor, another structural oppressive factor, and then those two factors together. And he finds that um, the interaction term between structural racism and anti-LGBT uh, 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 policy variable was most significant for perceived burden and heavy drinking, suggesting that this intersectional mat factor matters more than each one of these individual uh, uh, structural policy factors. So I'm gonna center some of my work now on police violence, and I'm gonna talk about how police violence relates to the health of black sexual minority men. Um, what I perceive, uh, so this is a picture that I got from the internet. I think I got it from maybe the New York Times or something. I'm not, I don't quite remember. What this is is a police officer who says the following to what I perceive to be a black boy. What do you want to be when you grow up? Alive. I don't know about you. When I was a child, I was thinking about playing, not being alive. What do we know? We know that black boys feel unsafe in neighborhoods. Empirical data shows that. We also know that police seeing practices and police murder is a leading cause of death for black, and black boys and men, as well as black women. So before I get into data, I think it's just really important to center humanity. So this is a quote from Letedrick uh, Widrum, uh, who is Jacob Blake's sister, who is a black man who was harmed by police. She said the following, I'm not sad, I'm not sorry. I'm angry and I'm tired. I've cried, I haven't cried one time. I stopped crying years ago. I'm numb. I've been watching people, watching police kill people who look like me for years. Um, there are so many ways that I could have presented this and I thought at length the ways to present this. There are so many names and I wanna honor names so there are some names here but these are some pictures of some black men and boys who've been harmed with the, the, uh, the arms of the police. Of course, you may be most familiar with George Floyd because he got a lot of attention, perhaps because it was white when the COVID pandemic, uh, the acute phase of the pandemic where many of us were in isolation period. Um, here's his, his uh, story. Um, 
But George was, uh, died in, on March 25th of, of 2000 in Minneapolis. Um, after uh, conflicting uh, autopsy reports, uh, it was later uh, uh, ruled a homicide, and the officers were later charged. Um, there were many protests. Um, I don't think I quite realized until I started to travel a little bit more internationally um, after this how, why, how, how, how uh, uh, global the protests were. And I just want to point to the sign because um, after George died, uh, Rashid, uh, Rashad uh, Brooks died, and this person uh, who was a protester uh, aptly and interestingly noted, I had to change the sign to Rashad Brooks. So here's one study. We looked at the longitudinal association between police harassment um, and experiences of violence um, in a sample of black sexual men across six cities. We wanted to look at whether police violence related to uh, various forms of community and intimate partner violence while also accounting for uh, a, a baseline experiences of, of violence. We use data from HBTN 061, which includes black social and men in three cities, including Washington, D.C., San Francisco, et cetera. What did we find? The blue line represents uh, uh, police harassment due to sexuality and race, and the red line represents uh, police harassment due to uh, race or sexuality. What do we find? We find significant associations for this intersectional measure of police harassment, meaning that if you report police harassment due to your race and sexuality, you see more associations with violence than when, when you see police harassment due to either one for either or. So we followed this up. We wanted to look at whether police harassment may be associated with mental health burdens in our sample. Um, including psychological vulnerability, psychological distress, and depressive symptomology. Again, we use data from HPTN 061. And here, perhaps not surprisingly, similarly we find that uh, 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 people who report neighborhood police harassment are more likely to report these negative psychosocial outcomes, including um, distress to, uh, to experience of homophobia. We have some analysis where we look at policing practices and substance use, where we find that, not surprisingly, that police harassment is associated with substance use, including binge drinking, methamphetamine use, and heroin use. And finally, the latest paper we have that just came out is we look at police harassment and healthcare utilization. And we find that police harassment is associated with more um, uh, 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 medical mistrust and uh, more missed healthcare visits among black sexual minority men. So this is uh, the paper that I referred to earlier, where we look at neighborhood policing practices at HIV status neutral healthcare uh, in, in our cohort N2. Um, just briefly, N2 includes a sample of over 600 black sexual minority men. Um, we also include trans women. In this analysis, it doesn't include trans women, so I want to name that. Um, most of our participants were from the Chicago site, but we also have uh, over 200 participants from Jackson, Mississippi, uh, New Orleans, and Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Um, we see here that uh, about 38% of our sample report that um, excessive police force is a big problem in their neighborhoods. And more substantively, we see that uh, police, uh, uh, excessive police force is associated with lower odds of PrEP use among current PrEP users, lower odds of ART use among uh, those who are living with HIV, um, and uh, uh, lower odds of HIV status neutral care, so whether one was on PrEP or ART. So I started to think about intersectionality a little bit further, recognizing that one's race and sexuality are first of course, just one aspect of who they are. And this is the article that I asked my students to read, um, which looks at uh, race uh, and body size, and how body size may also impact um, the likelihood of being uh, frisked, searched, and forced. Uh, in, in force. 
So these are results, perhaps not surprisingly, uh, black and Latinx men who report higher body sizes are more likely to have negative police experiences. So your higher your BMI, the more likely you are to experience being frisked and searched by the police. And the higher your BMI, if you're a, a black and, uh, or Latinx uh, man, you're more likely to experience a for, use of force of police. So in our cohort now, we're currently in cycle seven of N2, where we're actively, uh, we're collecting, excuse me, uh, objective BMI data. I don't know if, I'm, if we're gonna have the, the sample to actually replicate this, but my ideal would just, I would like to replicate this in, in our, um, our sample, considering effect modification by BMI. So we've relaunched N2 in September to um, account for these uh, uh, new research questions. We have new funding, so we're focusing on substance use and sleep as two main aspects. This is a, a launch that we had in Chicago for our, our study. Um, sleep is one of the, uh, one of the, the main things we're, we're also focusing on. Um, some challenges. Some challenges um, when we think about intersectional research overall is collecting different data and uh, uh, complex data of different types at multiple levels. Um, thinking thoughtfully about sample sizes, who, who, who comprises our sample, et cetera. Some future research are um, more research implementing multi-level intersectional perspectives, um, and really thinking through specific interventions incorporating multi-level um, and intersectional perspectives. So now I'm gonna talk about positionality um, Andrew Hall is probably one of the leaders when it comes to intersectionality. He has a seminal article that talks about how and why we should uh, uh, develop uh, positionality statements. What is positionality? Positionality essentially is um, how differences in social position, social power, uh, um, uh, um, uh, shape identities and shape uh, perspectives. And essentially the idea of positionality similar to reflexivity in qualitative researcher, qualitative research, excuse me, is this disclosure of one's identity in their research. Um, here's a little bit more about positionality. Um, it encompasses, again, revealing things about ourselves um, uh, in our work, such as our race. Um, this really harkens back to the idea of lived experience and the importance of lived experience. And of course, many scholars have talked about that, such as Audre Lorde. Um, I mentioned Patricia Hill Collins as being one of the leaders uh, in intersectionality. She also wrote this book on, on black feminist thought and, and, and really centering the importance of lived experience. Um, there's a long history to positionality um, that I'll just, I'll just highlight uh, um, is important. And it's important for a, a wide range of reasons. Um, one, it's acknowledging the, subject, the, subject, the subjectivity in science. And then two, it's um, really uh, uh, important to challenge uh, changing uh, 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 power dynamics. And there's this strong connection between intersectionality and positionality. And there's a, a wide range of reasons that um, positionality can be a useful framework for health equity including uh, identifying disparities, challenging stereotypes, um, cultural humility, et cetera. The current practice for positionality. So I had a colleague in, um, in a recent review say, well, this actually isn't uh, the way you do positionality statements. So I said, okay, I'm not sure I agree with that. And so I started to read what the standards are and I realized, perhaps not surprisingly, there are no standards. So we're currently trying to think through what standards may look like when it comes to positionality statements, but I'll share with you what I'm trying to do in my work and my practice. Um, one, I think that positionality, or including that in our work, is an aspect of cultural rigor. So um, I'm explicitly kind of stating that in our, in our science and in our positionality statements. Um, these are examples from uh, papers, books, and presentations and grants where I explicitly talk about aspects of my position and why I think that it's important um, in terms of our work. So for example, my blackness and my queerness are central parts to my identity. 
When people see me, though, I recognize that the first thing they see me as a black man, and I talk about things that I wrote about in that way. So I'm going to transition from talking about our work on sexual minority men a little bit to talking about um, some of our work on trans women. Um, in December, so last year, we just completed the full cohort. Um, I think we have a retention rate of about 84 uh, percent. We have 314 trans women uh, of color in New York in our cohort. These are some, some demographics. Um, the sample is mainly Latinx and mainly black. Um, uh, 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 about 54% are, are English speakers, about 34% are, are, are Spanish speakers. Um, you see many things here, but one of the most striking things is that about 60% of our sample report uh, being um, uh, having food insecurity. So one thing that we've been thinking about a lot in our team is our identities and how it relates to our work. And one, this question came up uh, in, in our research group. What are some of the benefits of centering lived experience in uh, trans research for participants? And one thing that we wanted to do for ourselves, those of us who weren't transgender, was to really question our, sorry, question our own positionality um, for this work, which we've done. Um, maybe I'll skip that. Excuse me. And I'll say one thing that we're explicitly doing to recognize positionality is that we're explicitly centering trans leadership in our studies and we're uplifting trans voices in a number of ways. One thing through our CAB, um, um, through the grants that we're doing, um, we're also, of course, highlighting our position. And so this is one just example of, of us doing so. Dr. So and so represents this population, Dr. Sonso represents the other population. And this was an example from a grant application that we submitted, I think this is about a year ago. Um, there are a number of challenges also to this work, including confronting our own biases. I think that's very challenging, but yet important. Um, as well as communicating our practice and our positions. I think there's a lot of complications for that. Um, some future research, um, the importance of implementing positionality uh, in uh, SGM research broadly, and the importance of thinking about position and power. One thing that I spent years doing is thinking through the importance of CABs and seeing CAB members be excited, but also seeing there be frustrations because of power dynamics, et cetera. So one of the first steps that we're doing is we have only now integrated scientific and community advisory boards where I'm trying to level the playing field in terms of scientific expertise, recognizing that community advisory board members have just as much scientific expertise as our scientific advisory board members. Um, so just broadly, when it comes to health equity research, the pr my perspective is that approaches to health equity research are largely to do nothing, um, but other approaches to promote diversity within teams. And an approach I've been thinking about is this model that I developed called the Health Equity and Research Production Model. Um, it was just accepted, but the caution is that I think I'm gonna retract it because I think it needs a little bit of work, um, to be honest. Um, but it was accepted, which is exciting. Um, the model's a little small, but there are four things that it centers. One, it centers active engagement in the communities. Two, it centers thinking about um, uh, uh, the research teams. Three, it centers thinking about the research uh, authorship. And then finally, it centers thinking about the team when it comes to um, research grants. One thing I've also been thinking about um, when it comes to the model is inequities in a wide range. One is inequities in terms of career stage, including I think it's very difficult for early career scientists to launch their careers or get their careers off the ground, so to speak. Um, so one thing I've been thinking about is how we infuse that in our system, in our model. And so this is the first grant that I was awarded in R21 uh, for the P18 neighborhood study. Uh, I was the PI, and one of my former students, who's now a assistant professor at NYU, uh, uh, Dr. Kim, uh, led a lot of the an analytical work there. And so while uh, he started as a student to publish with these data, He's now transitioning to be a senior author on these papers, where I think I'm second or maybe second to last or something like that. Why does this matter? Um, this matters for a wide range of reasons. 
We know that there are inequalities when it comes to health, but there, we know there are also inequalities in research production. These are, in my, my essay, I, I talk a lot about some of the inequalities, but here's a PNS a article that says that non-white scientists appear on fewer editorial boards, spend more time uh, uh, having their papers in review, and receive fewer citations. Uh, this is a paper from Dr. Erica Warner that showed that there are gender differences in the receipt of NIH R01s for junior faculty. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll just pause here and say that the goal of the model is to start to address these things or start to unpack that. And I'll share how we're applying this to our work in East Africa, Tijuana. Tijuana in Swahili stands for nothing, but nothing for, or means nothing for us without us. Um, so I'm currently building the Tijuana Columbia Center focused on sexual and gender minority health, uh, with the hub being in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, just a little bit of context. My first trip to Kenya was in March of 2023, and this is what I was met with. I learned the, the term gayism, um, where essentially um, uh, the newspaper was uh, 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 saying negative things about a, a, a population. What did I do? I first started with the model by engaging with community members immediately. So this is me with um, a, a group of sexual minority men in Nairobi, and this is me with a group of, of sexual minority men and trans women um, in Nairobi, part of a, a sex a, a work group organization. And what they start, literally started to do was to tell me their concerns, tell me the things they were having in their life so we can start to shape our research questions. Um, these are just some of the key findings for our focus groups. Um, some of these findings are, are, are being used now in a, a grant that I'm working on, such as the importance of safe clinics, uh, including LGBT-friendly clinics, the importance of social media in their lives, um, and the importance of HIV prevention being commingled with other health interventions, so for example, mental health interventions. Um, what are we doing at Tijuana? One, we are intentionally being thoughtful about uh, uh, positionality and intersectionality, so we're building that into our designs now. Two, we're building an, an uh, integrated scientific and community advisory board. Three, we're working very hard to hire staff that from the community. So as an example, we're, we're focusing on black sexual minority men as one uh, key population that we're hiring. And we're using the model as a framework for our, our, our work. So in summary, um, it's important that we look at intersectionality and positionality in health equity research. Both matter. Um, I think that it, it's clear that one of the ways that we can uh, uh, promote the model is by uh, centering or including scientists from minoritized backgrounds and research teams, citing scientists from minority research backgrounds and research products, and meaning grants and papers, and considering the model. Um, there are many groups who are doing this work, and this is just one approach, but I think it's an approach that we could uh, uh, work towards health equity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your discussion, Dr. Duncan. I think um, one of the things that came up for me during your presentation was around misclassification. Um, and I'm wondering, I, I think that example of festival um, bake, Johnny Cake, was um, really eye-opening. And I, I think the question would be, I would connect that to maybe a misclassification and within a conversation of heterosexual men within our HIV diagnosis numbers. So oftentimes we primarily focus on same gender loving or sexually minority men, yet you know, for many years um, a group of heterosexual men are saying you know, we're not being included, we're not being at the table. So maybe can you speak to ways in which we can delineate a little bit better um, when we think about heterosexuals or those persons who are not routinely reflective in our diagnosis or you know, prevalence numbers. Does that make sense? It does. You, 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 the, the question is, is 
how do we include or uh, men who are in the sexual minority men category but who may not represent them, meaning men who may identify as heterosexual but who engage in same-sex behavior practices? I don't know if they engage in the same behaviors, but how do we drive down, how do we distill out more, you know, just to include a larger conversation? Um, I think the question is, is broadly, Daniel, about inclusion then, and about how we include people in science and maybe work. Um, I, I think that our, our whole goal is to quantify the human experience, right? And I, I think that the, the goal of, of my talk, or, or the, the point of why I think that we should think about intersectionality, positionality, is that I think it will do, it'll make, we will do better jobs at quantifying that human experience. And the, the goal is not that everyone necessarily has to have the perfect lived experience, because I don't think that will be the case. And I also think if we think about the pipeline, which is why I tried to, or the pathway to professorship or you know, how we produce research, we won't have the perfect lived experience in everything. That just, I don't think that will exist, or at least not in today's times. And so I think there are a number of ways where we can think about getting that lived experience, which I think is important. A cab is one way. Um, <coughs> I think our, our philosophy and my philosophy kind of overall is meeting people where they're at. And I think it depends in so many ways. Um, how can we include people in science in different ways? Uh, you know, we do studies that are online a lot, which comes with certain challenges in person. Um, I think that, you know, this idea of hidden populations, I, I'm not sure that it really exists. I just think it's finding people and, and respecting people. And when people feel that, people will engage. I mean, our, our study with trans women of color, I, I, I can't tell you how many colleagues told me how difficult the study was gonna be. And yes, every study is difficult, but from the context of the successes, our study has been more than a success. You know, we, we, we're just now publishing it, but um, I'm not sure to answer your question, Daniel, but I would say the, the cultural humility part and doing the methods that align with the question, but also the population, Sometimes that may mean not being online, but being out in the field or being in certain places. Um, I think it's important, just as a researcher, and especially in the health equity place space, excuse me, to be as nimble as possible to meet people where they're at. I'm not sure I answered your question totally, but so you had a hand up, Kevin. Yeah, thank you. Um, my question is about uh, uh, community-informed research and and particularly around cabs. Um, you know, when you are starting to work with a new population, for example, in Nairobi, or the, the work you've done with um, trans women, um, I'm thinking about the process, right? You come in with this grant that's been developed, you have very well outlined hypotheses, um, and you gotta hit the ground running on day one so that your surveys are ready to go, and you recruit and you know you get five years and it goes by quickly. Um, how do you take a step back? At what stage do you take a step back and listen and allow your um, your surveys, your hypotheses to change um, when that could take six months, nine months to recruit a cab and and have your meetings and listen and reflect? I would say I'm trying to do it differently now. So and while there are ideas that I've had, and of course we've met many times before, kind of going to Nairobi, we've met an entire semester, almost you know, about nine months. But when I went, I just, I just gave a presentation about kind of our work and what matters to me, and, I, and the conversation was all about what matters to them. Literally, that was it. And through the conversations in the focus groups, where I'm crafting their project to be reflective of the community. But I also recognize that I'm at a stage in my career where I can pause in ways because I have funding in other ways to, to allow my ideas to germinate or put differently to really have a true community-based approach which I think are less difficult at different career stages. Um, but I'm, I'm literally going in this where we've met with community members and said, hey, what matters to you? Literally. And they've said what matters. And of course, it's a meeting of the minds. So what matters to you and what's, what funding is available slash, you know, what expertise fit in. But it's, We've been really talking to community members sincerely and getting their advice in that way. But to your point, Kevin, we have, you know, it's a system and there are grants. And so with TURNT in particular, the grant was funded. And so we went to different community groups and we said, hey, 
this is a project that's funded, how can we make this work for you? And what we decided to do in turn was we de-emphasized the HIV component. Yes, the grant had a lot of HIV questions in it because of the funder, so we met those funder goals, but we also had a lot of questions about mental health, substance use, things that weren't part of the funding, the FOA at all, but it's because we knew the community wanted them. Um, so I'm not sure that answers the question, but kind of within the, exist, the current system of, of getting grants funded and awarded and applying for them, I'm, I'm trying to actually do that community work. And I think part of the, the model is that I think that while we value the work of communities, and when I was a student, you know, we read things by you know, uh, uh, Gina Yang from UNC and those kind of high-level scholars in community work, I just am not convinced that that's being done today. Um, not because people don't value the role of communities, just because of the current system and how we have to work and the pressures that we have to move our products along so quickly. So as you just said, you get a grant, but in the next day, you kind of have to go in the field. Not necessarily the next day, but maybe in a month. But a month is not a long time. You know? So we're, I'm, I'm trying to think about ways we can now do the work in the systems that we say that matter, but also in the systems that really exist, which is our grants, as example. That's a great question, Kevin. Um, I, I was wondering if you could speak to how do you prevent a culture of tokenism so that you have, for example, a, a journal uh, or a granting agency and they say, you know, look, we have a, a black queer man on our leadership team, but how do you break the cycle of tokenism and develop true leadership in that. And then also on the other side of it, if you could relay some of the struggles that you see or experience as you deal with a culture of, no, we really just wanted um, a token leader and then we, you know, having to apologize or not apologize about, well, I'm sorry, I'm a real leader and I'm creating change. Yeah, I think I'm gonna answer that from the question of the East Africa work, because I think that's a, a space where I'm an insider and an outsider, but mainly an outsider, although, yeah. Um, I, re I really do believe in the importance of community, but we have this kind of chicken and egg problem where colleagues will say, well, hey, you know, and we're developing models on this so that things are coming out, but uh, hey, uh, here's an example of something, an issue that I had. I wanted to know the power calculation for something, and I literally had no data to, to, to actually get that estimate. There was nothing that existed, so I didn't know what to do. And so we're doing a pilot study, and we're gonna get the numbers, et cetera. One of the other things is, again, um, there aren't a lot of colleagues in the region who can do this work for a number of reasons. One of the existing policies. So there aren't a lot of sexual oriented men who, who have doctorates, who are equipped to be professors, who can do this work. So part of the goal for the center is, is to create a robust training program that I won't do this work. Someone from the community, hopefully, and we have someone in mind, but hopefully someone who who represents the community, who's from the community, will ultimately take the center and, 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 and have the center be something. That's actually the goal. So as the population works in our work, it's not that they're being tokenized. You're in, you're, you're in, in, in line to be the next leader of this initiative. Um, I'm not sure how to avoid tokenism, but one thing I will say is that I've done a lot of work now kind of thinking about the structure of how we do our science and part of the reason why I've been thinking about restructuring our cabs is that cabs aren't always effective. And what you're talking about, the issue of tokenism, as I've been reading the science of cabs, that's an issue that's come up. So I'm not sure I have an answer to it, but I've just been thinking about the way we do our work. And part of the talk is saying that I think we can do our work a little bit differently. Um, and not just think, I think we need to do it differently. And in some ways, it's really a call for action. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I do think we need to think about that because it comes up in our work. Um, it hasn't come up in the East African work in this way, but I'm avoiding that issue by addressing it intentionally by as a, someone I'm thinking about in particular who represents the population. We want him to be the leader one day or one of the leaders of, our, of, our, of the initiatives. All right, we're actually at time, but I would strongly encourage everybody, we do have a reception set up out there, so um, if you have additional 
thoughtful questions for our speaker. Um, but just thank you, Dr. Duncan, for joining us here, thank for coming to GSU, and for giving us an enlightening talk. And look forward to chatting more out at the reception. <laughs>